it's been it's been a wonderful experience going through the hurdles of life and reaching the level that I am. Many people mistaken me to be a son of Kofi Annan. <laughs> okay, fact, okay. I am never a son of Kofi Annan, and actually, I didn't meet him. Okay. So you find out somebody is occupying a position that the person is not worth it. That is in terms of public service. Yeah, because the uncle was there and felt like they should push their people in there, but not really giving it as a merit based on maybe you qualify for it. So we have our system. When we talk about corruption in our system and we look, compare it with what is happening in other parts of the world, meritocracy has been killed by corruption. When it comes to education, mm. we see education as only the former school. Yeah. Which is one way or the other, a system made to keep our minds from thinking. <laughs> so true education is after gaining the knowledge, yeah, the application of that knowledge to solve the problems of the society is education. Uh, John, you guys have been doing a lot of uh, interesting work. See, when I go online I, and I see people like you, doing things you are doing, hey, I'm, I'm excited. I'm very, very excited. So, see, let's start. Uh, I want you to uh, introduce yourself to my audience. Tell them who you are and what you do. Okay, thank you so much. My name is John Kofi Annan. John is a public speaker, a Pan-Africanist, a tech trainer, and entrepreneur coach, I'm also a leadership trainer. Okay. My focus has been on youth and women, especially coaching them, training them, and helping them earn a living out of those skills they learn, especially the tech training skills I offer to young people. Um, basically, I grew up from a very humble background. But my humble background did not humble me. Okay. <laughs> I, have to, I have to go through the hurdles of life, mm. self-educate myself, uh, self-train myself. To be frank, my mom didn't know the university I attended until it was time for my graduation. Wow. Daddy has passed away about 20 years ago. So um, basically... Coming from that kind of background, um, I was challenged. I completed school for two years. I had no job. Mm. Um, I look at it and opportunity came. I had to relocate to Nigeria. Um, and then from there, I begin to build myself because almost every three months I was taking new course. I'm a chartered secretary and administrator. I'm one of the best students in corporate law. Um, Nigeria, and I do a lot of a lot of things. <coughs> Sorry. So basically, it's been it's been a wonderful experience going through the hurdles of life and reaching the level that I am. Many people mistaking me to be a son of Kofi Annan. <laughs> okay, fact, okay. I am never a son of Kofi Annan, and actually, I didn't meet him. Okay. Wow. Oh, man. See, the interesting thing I heard from you, the most interesting thing I heard from you is that your journey trained you, made you a better person. And that is wonderful. Why, why do I say it's, it's wonderful? Because Africa, we have a, a long journey 
with difficulties along the road. And we need people who see the process as a exploratory journey, interesting to discover new things. You see, and that is that is kind of the kind of mentality we need to have to enable us to actually go through the those difficult issues we have to go through. Okay. See that's very true. Yes. Yes. That's very true. See, you just told us that we, you do so many different things. So please, please, I, I want you to expand on some of those things you have been doing and how you have helped people prepare on their own individual journeys. All my life, I grew up with a mother whose vision is always helping people. Mm. So while I grew up with my mom, uh, my mom sells tomatoes, and I was selling tomatoes with my mom at the age of seven, all throughout to even the time I left for uh, tertiary education. Now there's something I discovered with my mom. My mom was very kind and always giving to people, mm. always taking care of the of other people. So while growing up, I loved her way towards people and how almost everybody know her and how she does her things. Mm. And that also imbibed in me the spirit of um, giving out to people without necessarily looking at what you can get back. Yes. So starting the journey of idea, I worked as an assistant registrar of Gulf Rico University, Enugu. So today even ends, marks the four years I resigned from the university oh, as assistant okay. registrar. Now, why did I resign from the university? I started up a tech training hub in the university with the mindset of training young people to be skill-oriented, and also have entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. So looking at it, if I find that idea, though it was growing in the university system, that cannot transform. Like the vision was different from what the university would want from me. Yeah. Because definitely a university wants academic processes. You have to come certify this, take exams and all that. I didn't want that kind of system. I wanted people I'm grooming. They come learn their skills and go and start entrepreneurship out of that. So basically, working with idea, idea project, Innovative Data Entrepreneurship Academy. When I started the project six years ago, the vision is actually to make sure that I train young people who who embrace technology yeah. to solve problems of society. Yeah. And by solving problems of society, automatically they will earn from that because money do not come just like that. Money yeah. comes when you solve problems. Exactly. Money comes when you, you, you give something out to the society, which is very valuable. So you must exchange value for money. But my mindset was that if I should train these guys or ladies, young people, old men and all that, they should be able to earn a living out of these skills I'm teaching them. So idea, which is my prototype or my baby, is basically today I checked and I realized that we've trained over 9,000 wow. young people across Africa. Wow. In now, just last two weeks, we trained 1,500 students of Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Ghana. And so today, some of the students, it was free. I spent four days with them, and it was free. I'm doing that for other universities. I go with my team, we train, and then we come back. I take care of it. I'm not asking for government sponsorship. I'm not asking for foreign sponsorship. 
So the difficulty in the journey is that I am sacrificing a lot to make sure that these young people learn their skills. Yeah. And I have, I'm also coaching them on how they can scale businesses through tech. Because we have the career aspect of tech where you work for an organization. Yeah. And we have the business aspect of tech where you need to start up. So I have guys who are also having different startups who have come to learn at idea and they have different startups. And it's been it's been wonderful. It's been wonderful. Currently, we have students from over 25 countries. We have student training over from UK, US, Tanzania, excuse yeah. me, Tanzania, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria. And I love Nigeria so much because the young men here are so energetic and so serious when it comes to tech. So we're having students from all these countries. And yesterday, for instance, while I was in class, one of my students in UK said something. He said, sir, what you are teaching us simply means that I don't know anything in tech. <laughs> it means that I'm learning. And there's a guy who has lived in US for a long, uh, UK for a long time. Mm. So that is what, that's what we are doing. And we are focused more on women also because I said something to myself. Every woman who wants to come into tech and so far as idea is concerned, I made a pledge that every woman gets 25% scholarship to study in idea. Ooh. So if we are training a course and the course is one, uh, $100, Every woman pays $50. Every African woman. That is what I'm doing for African women. So, um, the, and the young girls, I want to drive a lot of young ladies and young girls into tech. So mm. that is also one thing I have taken, taken into consideration. Wow. You are doing fantastically well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the work you're doing. Well, tell us a little, little bit about your, your journey. Your journey in Nigeria. Your journey in Endugu. You know, uh, wh wh why did you decide to relocate to Nigeria, one? And secondly, to Endugu in particular. Why? Mm. <laughs> okay <laughs> I, after um, after about two two years of not being able to get work in Ghana mm. even though I was a graduate but you see work in Ghana is about politics if your political party is not in power you don't have access to work wow and that, that, if you don't that bad? if you don't belong to a political party your own is even worse. So yeah. what it means that I was looking out for a job. I've suffered the fate of what every graduate suffers today. Um, there was a day I was showing one lady how my shoe had to look like out of working from one company to another looking for a job. And if you don't know anybody, it doesn't matter how sharp you are. It doesn't matter how qualified you are. You have to suffer. Hold on, my friend. Hold on, hold on. Are you telling me that we have dug ourselves into that corner that we don't allow people to progress without political leverages? That bad? That is... That is that is, that is where we have gotten to as, as Africa. The case of, the case, like, for instance, people go into political parties or go into political career, not really because they, they want to be there, but because they want to associate so that they can have leverages when government is in power. So let me ask a question. When this government is in power, no member 
of another party is employed into any business. And remember, most of the businesses or most of the ventures in Ghana especially had to be government ventures because how many entrepreneurs we have, do we have? Unlike Lagos, that you can have a lot of private organizations employing. In Ghana, how many private em em employers can employ and pay better? And it's also even the same in, in Nigeria. So I find myself an opportunity to work in a university. Um, when I came into Nigeria, um, I was brought in by a professor, a Ghanaian professor into Nigeria. And when I got the job as a as, uh, confidential secretary to the vice chancellor of Gofroko University, I started like that. But I had to give myself time to grow. So the seven years, the seven years, four months I spent in the university, almost every three months, you see me taking new courses. You see me learning new things. You see me exposing myself to new knowledge. And that is how, that is how I grew to become an assistant registrar in, the, in my third year of working with the university. But one thing is that, you see, every system has a way of refining you. Yeah. Every system has a way of helping you grow. My boss initiative was he wanted me to grow. So there was nothing that I could do than to grow. Um, he wanted to see more of me because he, the job was demanding and he was always demanding for new innovations. So I have to learn more and I have to also uh, build that capacity, leadership capacity to be able to handle problems, to be handle, able to handle tasks that are difficult and all that. Sometimes mm -hmm. I might have sleepless nights just to deliver on a project. Yeah. But that is what makes a good, um, a good employee or a good servant or a good leader. Without being a servant, you cannot be a leader. So exactly. funny yeah. enough, yesterday I was with the, one of the professors, the former assistant, the former registrar of Gofrey Okoye University, Professor FCS, and he was very happy that I now live in Ghana and I'm doing well, having speaking engagements across countries, training students across countries. And he said to me, Kofi, you did so much well for Godfrey Okoye University. And that is one of the things that I can't actually mention my journey into career journey into prominence without remembering the university, remembering the vice chancellor, Professor Dr. Chris and Aneke, remembering the pro-chancellor, Professor Mwachuku Okeke, who is a professor of cooperative law, uh, international law. He's also a professor of law in Golden Gate University, US. These are men that saw my growth. These are men that were interested in my growth. So um, they are my mentors. Um, they, are, they are a father to me. And I've always maintained that relationship of learning from the elderly, because if you don't learn from the elderly, it's very, very difficult for you to grow. Now, you have to also understand what are the mistakes they made that you don't need to make. Exactly. So I spend quality time with these mentors who are older, far older, 80 years, 70 years, those are the people I spend time with. And I have many of them. Okay. So my career growth, my career growth is not just working in the environment, but also relationship building. I have to build along the way. Very good. Very good. Kofi, tell me, tell me, what do you think about meritocracy in Africa? Because I'm asking you that this because what you have told me is that coming from Ghana, meritocracy is not 
it wasn't available. And when you came into Enugu, it seems there's some kind of it in that in that space. So um, tell, though, tell me what, what about, you think about it. Yeah. When we talk about meritocracy, um we are looking at private and private system and public service. Okay. Now public service all across Africa, including Nigeria, is not based on meritocracy. Yeah. It's based on whom you know, or you belong to a party, or your or maybe your relative is in position. But now it is no longer even whom you know. It is who knows you. Hmm. So you find out somebody is occupying a position that the person is not worth it. That is in terms of public service. Yeah. Because the uncle was there and felt like they should push their people in there, but not really giving it as a merit based on maybe you qualify for it. So we have our system. When we talk about corruption in our system and we look, compare it with what is happening in other parts of the world, meritocracy has been killed by corruption. Or, or, or is meritocracy being killed by nepotism? Nepotism. And, favoritism. And favoritism and tribal. 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 Yeah. I, and it's not even only tribal. Religious. Okay. Religious. Yeah. Religious. Regional. Regional. In, in Nigeria, the, the division is even more. Aside the ethnocentrism, tribalism, religios religiosity, we still have what we call the regional centrism. Mm. The regional centrism has now also pushed Nigeria even more divided. Okay. For instance, they will say you are from Southeast. Yeah. So you don't deserve to work in Abuja. Even in, in government appointment. Yeah. So so a particular a you, particular region okay. is given more privilege than the other. Okay. Do, do you see do what do you see if we continue doing this? Do you see the way out for Africa if we continue appointing people not based on merit? But based on all these other re uh, reasons, how do you, what do you see for Africa if we continue doing this? Um, we are going to get ourselves divided the more. And remember, the more we divided, the more we fall as a continent. We cannot strive to be better if we are not united as a continent. Like of today, people in different political parties, in different regions, in different tribes, see others as inferior. But how do we build a nation out of people seeing others as inferior? How do we build a nation out of people seeing others as enemies? We find ourselves in the same country, but a particular tribe sees another tribe as their enemies. A particular tribe see another tribe that nobody in this particular tribe can lift himself into the exalted position of presidency. That no matter what, we should fight against them. The problem we have is all across Africa. Yeah. 
look at look at what is happening all around. You will see that people are praising uh putting tribal sentiment on most of the issues that we discuss. Okay. Uh, we were talking about an issue on LinkedIn the other day, and somebody was just talking out of tribalism. So far as the president is from your tribe, he's a saint. Okay. So far as the man who is corrupt in government office is from your tribe, he's a saint. If we keep building Africa like this, there's no way Africa will thrive and Africa will thrive and Africa will prosper. Okay. See, it's uh, not happening only in Nigeria. No, I, I agree. I agree. And and we'll, we'll talk, we'll go back, we'll come back to that because. I I see that as something important and we we haven't dealt with it properly and that's why it's still continuing after decades of independence we our countries have never sat down to say okay we are 50 tribes in this small space, okay? We are called a country. So how can we ensure that we will not use a tribal divi uh, division to keep us down? You see, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a need for a country to come together and ask themselves, what is it about this country? Why, why would this tribe and this tribe live together in this country? What is the common value that holds us together? I don't, I don't know if any of our countries, okay, maybe apart from uh, Tan Tanzania, has ever sat down to think about this. And I think this is one of the main reasons why the division, ethnic div division, is still prominent in our uh, underdevelopment. Anyway, let, let's, let's go forward. I believe in, in continuous education and I, uh, from what you have told me, you are definitely into it, okay? Uh, training, coaching, seminars, and all that, okay? Uh, and I believe it's crucial for Africa's development. Now, as uh, somebody who is into it, do you believe that uh, as a continent, we have done well in, in promoting continuous education on, on the continent? Do you think we are, we are investing uh, enough in, in it? Thank you so much. I think when it comes to education, mm. we see education as only the former school. Yeah. Which is one way or the other, a system made to keep our minds from thinking. <laughs> so true education is after gaining the knowledge, yeah. the application of that knowledge to solve the problems of the society is education. Yeah, I agree. And that is wisdom in the Bible. Okay. So when we talk about wisdom, wisdom is not about having a gray hair. Mm, mm. Wisdom is not about reading books. Okay. Wisdom is about the knowledge you have acquired, the skills you have acquired. Do you transform it to solve the problems of your society? But what do we see today? We are people who go through university system and once they come out, they are looking for solutions. They are never solution makers or they are never solution providers. 
That is the education system we have had in Africa. And that is even across almost every university system. Let me ask a question. We talk, I've been in the university system, but how do you, how do you confirm a professor of, or a doctorate of entrepreneurship on a professor who has no business? Ah. So the question is that, how do you teach entrepreneurship without having a business? And this is what we respect as education. That is, go to school, get a first degree, after first degree, get a master's degree, after master's degree, get a PhD, and that is it. And they even made it be brainwashed in such a way that if you have the best of education, then you have to leave the shores of Nigeria, Ghana, Africa, to Europe, because that's where they give the best of education. And you go get masters, you get PhD, and you are the best. But let me ask a question. What is the essence of education when the problems of our society cannot be solved by those education qualifications. So you have professors who speak jargons. We have people who have gone to school speak jargons. We have people who are engineers and they cannot fix a door. We have people who are engineers and they cannot uh, work on a car. When they are cars poor, a professor of engineer takes his car to a mechanic, a roadside mechanic, who has no school, who has no education. So let me ask a question. What is real education? Yeah. So until we redefine education, we might think that schooling is education, but schooling is not education. Yeah. So what Africa is doing is we are schooling. Yeah. We are not being educated. Now, now uh, just to say this, uh, the same issue you have, you have, that you have just identified, okay, is also prominent in the West. Okay, it's very prominent because there are so many degrees people get now that that are not valuable. There are so many degrees that people get now that are not valuable. Now, compared to Africa, people who do, who study engineering, okay, in this, in the, in this, in the, in the UK, for example, they know how to do some things. Now, they may not be adept with their hands, okay, but they know how to design solutions Okay, that the technicians, the technicians can now implement. Okay, so yeah, we have we have the same similar issues. Yeah. So basically, um, when we talk about education in general, mm. to me, it's about acquisition of knowledge, skills to solve the problems of, of society, your community your country, your continent, and the world at large. Yes. Now, in solving these problems with what you have as knowledge, as skill, by 10, you transform the society. Now, for instance, you can imagine people go to test schools. All right. I know a computer science graduate who cannot operate a computer? <laughs> yes. So the question is, if we want to talk about real education, let's focus on skill. Skill acquisition based of schooling. If you are an engineer, focus on engineering. Get practical engineering skills. Yeah. If you are an and uh, maybe an agriculture extension officer, 
you don't have a business in the bank. But guess what is happening? Somebody studies his agriculture, instead of him to get into the farm and see solutions of producing new crops and then bringing in new hybrid of crops and all that from already existing ones, the person ends in the bank. So yeah. we have to change our education system. Okay. I was watching a video yesterday. Young men and women in China are in the factories producing phones. But here, our young men are in the schools praying. <laughs> yes. Because we have been brainwashed. I, my father was a pastor. I have been to Bible school. I'm a man of God. I've even seen the dead come back to life by God's grace. So I know what God does. But you see, God did not do certain things, even in the Bible. As Africans, we have to learn this. When the temple of Israel, the first temple needed to be built, God told Moses, I have put in two young men the spirit of skill and wisdom to craft, to do things. And when the whole Israel brought the gold, they brought it to this young man and they fabricated a lot of the vessels and all that for the temple from that. God did not just come down. He said, I'll put in them. So every person on earth, there's something God put in him. What is called talent. Going to school is just to help you sharpen your talent. Mm. But that is not what will make you live a fulfilled life. What is your talent? What has God given you? My talent, I love teaching. It's my passion. So whatever I have, knowledge I have, I feel like I should pass it on every day. That's my passion. Mm. You wake me up at any point in time, I can teach without necessarily bothering myself. It's part of me. Yeah. What has refined this is education. That is schooling. Yeah. So you don't go to school to throw away what God put in you as your potential. So somebody knows how to sing and goes to school and become a banker. <laughs> and she's not, not happy, she's a banker. Meanwhile, she has a talent as a singer. So it's about mindset. Some people believe that until you go to school, you work in a particular industry, you can never become rich. Mm. But to tell you the truth, sir, can I ask you a question? Go ahead. The gospel musicians we have in Nigeria. Yeah. And the musicians across the group, as well as secular musicians. Sinaj being a gospel musician, the video and all that. Are these guys not university graduates? Well, I, I would I would I would tell you the truth. Uh I in the last 10 plus years, I haven't uh, been following uh musicians globally okay so i don't know them i don't know them i don't know their songs okay i'm okay i'm old school okay i listen okay. to my 80s and 60s music okay 60s. but but yeah. i understand what, what you're saying okay they are, they are earning a living from their talent and skills yes. yes they are earning a living from their talent and skills so I have this mindset. If even we need to change the system of our education, yeah, we have to dive into what is called practically oriented based education system. Okay, I, and I agree. I do agree. I agree. Practically based, and we should. Now listen, let me tell you something. In Germany, they teach students in even junior secondary school senior secondary school mining yeah do they have any good 
No. <laughs> Why do they learn mining, engineering, mechanical things? Why? We have we have gold in Ghana. We have land in Ghana. We have land in in Nigeria. We have oil in Nigeria. Guess the course that if you don't pass, you cannot go ahead to university. What? Do you know what the those are the courses? What what? English language. Okay. If you don't pass English language, you can't enter any school. Mm. So the first question is the Chinese, who is an engineer, who cannot speak English. Does English take away his engineering profession? No, it doesn't. But let me let me let me say something. The Chinese have their books written in their language. Okay. See, chi China is not as diverse as Ghana. Okay. China, as big as it is, with the population it is, is not as ethnically diverse as Ghana. See, that's the difference. Okay. No, 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 very few of our languages have written versions. Okay, so to study in our countries, we need a language that almost all, our, all of our books are written in. So in Ghana, in Nigeria, it's English. That's what we, what we use. Some other countries, French. Okay, and Okay. Maybe, maybe in the in the in the in West uh, East Africa, maybe if if they can, if if they can write their books in Swahili, Swahili, maybe so. But until we have our books translated into a language that is commonly used, so that that's the, that's the reason. Okay. Do you know I was best in mathematics? Very, very good in mathematics. Very good. During my, during my primary school, my junior and senior secondary school days. Very, very good in mathematics. Guess why? Why? I learned mathematics with my local language. Okay. So learning mathematics with my local language was easier for me to understand. But you see, we have complicated the system. Now, who told Africans mm. that before the white man came with English language that we are communicating now, yeah. we didn't have a language that we were able to write? Okay. Uh, now, see, I would need you to, because I don't know. Now, I've asked the question of Yes. One of my guests before. Now, the the the, the alphabet of education, the mm. alphabet we use now, mm. the alphabet we use now. The the the, the, the let's say I'm a fanti. That's yeah. my that's my tribe. Being a fanti, I know all the alphabet we use in writing our word, and we have word represented everything. Okay. Excuse me to say that. So even the white man, before the white man came, we have alphabets that we could write. What, how were we communicating? How were, how were we naming things well, see, that we have? Now, Is it the white man I, 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 that I, I, named I those things again. for us? I will say this again. This, this again. See, so there are, the there are thousands of, of languages, okay? But, but, very few of them have written versions. See, that written is, versions are totally different from speaking versions. Speaking versions. Okay. Now, if, if, even even English, okay, written version of English, written version of French, written version of Chinese, written version of Spanish, have changed within the last yes. two hundred years. Okay? Yes. 
Yeah. So, so, so what we need to embrace is that first of all, we have to embrace what we have. Okay. In terms of education. And then teach courses according to what God has given us. Okay. So we cannot have gold. And then you have children of Africa learning English, learning um, what do you call it? Psychology. <laughs> oh, oh. And, <laughs> and then I don't know I'm coming. And then we have we have Germans who don't have gold. They will learn engineering. They will learn mining. Today, if I'm if I'm in authority today in Ghana, mm. first thing we're going to do is that we're going to make these courses, which are core to our society program, the yeah. core courses every student must learn. So, for instance, every student must learn agriculture from class one to senior secondary school. Okay. Yes. Because you must understand what God has given you and what you can transform. That thing God has given you to solve your problems. Now, I was talking to three children in, in my home in Ghana. And I asked them, what do you want to become in future? Then one of them told the other that, oh, me, I want to become a doctor. And the other one said, oh, me, I want to become a nurse. The other one said, oh, me, I want to be. Then the other one, the last one, when she was about to respond, one of them who has already responded, oh, you, you'll be a farmer. Then this young girl became furious and said, <laughs> how dare you say that I will be a farmer? How? Because we have told our children that farming is punishment. Mm, mm. Going to wheat is punishment. We have, been, we have been made in such a way that our mind has left how we feed ourselves. Today, every country, including Nigeria, including Ghana, in Africa, imports wheat from Ukraine, from yeah. Russia. Yeah. Made. What? 82% of the land of Ghana is still Arab, not cultivated. Yeah. Nigeria, I don't want to talk about it. So why don't we, in, if we want to see true growth of Africa, true education of Africa, we must begin to bring in courses that will transform the mindset of our youth towards self-reliance. First, if we cannot rely on ourselves first as Africans, every other thing is gone. I, agree. I do agree. I do agree. Now, now, uh, you mentioned that uh, agriculture should be taught all through from year one to year 12. Yes, yes. Now, now, yes, I, I do agree, but we must also note that uh, due to technology, okay, the improvement in technology, including farming technology, okay, that farming, agriculture, doesn't need so many people. If you use the technologies available, the number of people in even in Africa that will feed Africa, that will produce all the all the food for exports will be less than 10% of the population. Okay. It's very, so, very true. Yes. So, it's so, very, very true. so if, if, very even though know. even though we we want our people to learn the skills that are easily transferable in our in our society, uh, we should not. Uh, we should analyze what we need actually. Okay. Now, yeah, I agree with you that we need skill based education in 
every sector, every time, every every subject we teach. Okay, we need to teach skilled based education, not just theory. Okay, we teach too much theory without any application. Any application. Okay, we teach too much theory without application. So I I, I do agree, but this 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 is the thing. We need actually need to analyze everything we do. See, there's so there's right, right. there's so many there's so many what, what, there are so, what, what, yeah. what I'm trying to what I'm trying to say is bringing the consciousness yeah into the minds of African young people and even the children unborn. Yeah, that how you feed yourself is the first commandment God gave to man. Yep. Yeah. See, so I, I come, I come from a the family of, of farmers. Okay, my my uncles were big farmers. They had the big, they had plantations of so many things. But my cousins uh, have uh, abandoned those things. You know. So I come, I come from. A, in fact, my father is the was the was the was the poor one of his siblings because he was <laughs> a, because he was a teacher. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, his his that brother was, his that. brothers were farmers, and he, in the in the nineteen eighties, my one of my my uncles, my father's elder brother, his farm was so big that the then uh, new uh, new Nigerian bank in Benin came to his farm, took pictures of the farm for the calendar calendar either the nineteen eighty one or eighty two. Yeah, that was my uncle's farm. My you father's, my that. father, my father's old older brother. You you can get that. So so, so I I agree <laughs> that we need to we need to focus on things we need. Yes. Yeah, and my, I, mining and, and other said, things. Yes. Yes, I also said mining because when you yeah. go to Ghana right now, we are what is called Galamse. Mm. Galamse is illegal mining. And the illegal mining is spoiling almost all the water bodies in Ghana. Mm. Mm. There are only, I think, three water bodies in Ghana that have not been spoiled by yeah. illegal mining. Yeah. So we need we need to learn how to do it properly. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So we have to teach mining too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let them understand that hey, this is what we have, but we cannot create problems out of problems. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, so, that's true. So that's as I speak, true. as I speak with you now, we have more problems on our head almost every day. Yeah. Now all the water bodies that have been spoiled, no fishing activity can come in there. It will take two hundred years for that water to come back to normal. Well, hmm. just think yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we so, have so a... we have to we have to focus. What I mean is that we have to focus on practical based education. Yeah, that's true. That no, is very theory, true. Theory is not taking us to anywhere. No, we need we need the theory as as foundation for the practical applications. Okay, but we need to yes. involve our children in the practical. Uh, applications. Yes, that's correct. That's correct. John, I I I I like this. What I saw on your on your profile, on LinkedIn profile, that says John Kofi Annan stands for integrity, excellence, hard work, and innovation, In innovate innovativeness. So I want you to tell us uh, more about that. When we talk about integrity, yeah, integrity, it's just a simple thing. Consistency in character. Very good. That is, what are you known for? Mm. What, what are you known for? What good values are you known for? 
And actually, many people think integrity has to do with maybe you are good here and you are bad here. Mm. Integrity is actually the consistency of your character. Yeah. The moral values you cherish, mm. the virtues you cherish. Mm. This is, and practicing them to the core that everybody knows that this is whom you are. Yeah. That is really integrity. Yeah. Now, looking at it, for instance, I always, I'll, even if you are killing me, <laughs> I know I have to tell you the truth and I'm not afraid of anyone. Yeah. Because um, I believe that we are in this world to make the world better. Yeah. So today, if I'm going to define integrity, I will define integrity as what you do. What you do yeah. for the benefit of other humans. That is integrity. Mm. Mm. Okay. So anything that destroys life, anything you do that destroys the trust of people, anything you do that puts someone in a fix or in a situation of hell, mm. whether it be in, you are in governance, anywhere you find yourself, what you do that goes against people means that you don't have integrity. But mm. if whatever you do affect men and women on earth, humanity positively, you have okay. integrity. Okay. That, okay. Is, that is my definition today. Yeah. Whatever you do that affects people positively, humanity positively, is integrity. Okay. So if you are in political office, you are in a private office, you are in a company, anywhere you find yourself, yeah. what you do, that people will say, this person did this good for me. This person okay. did that good for me. And people can testify of your character. That is integrity. Okay. That is why we have leaders. Who boldly will steal the resources of a country and yet come and beg pensioners hmm. that they want to hold the monies of pensioners. Yeah. Integrity is gone. Yeah. So it, when we talk about integrity here, it's about your consciousness of being doing good and doing good and doing good and doing good must be consistent. Okay, John, John, see, I, I, I agree with you, but look at our, politi our political class, just like you said, a, politi a politician steals the money meant for millions of people of that of 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 the people they they are working they are, they are, they are, they, are, they are supposed to lead okay and they do it with total impunity and nobody our countries do not hold them to account how can we build integrity when people who don't display integrity in any way get away with all the things that they do against society now it's about system okay we were built or uh, we grew up with the mindset that you don't question an elder. Okay. African system. But as I speak with you now, there's a generation that is coming and they are rising up everywhere and they are asking questions. And I said to myself, a day is coming. You see this political class that thought they are far, they can play judicial system. They can manipulate. A day is coming. A day is coming. A day is coming. A day is coming. I do. I, I do agree with you. A day is coming. See, John. And they they are not. And also, 
the youth today, you see, the youth today has also been brainwashed. So what is happening in our system now is being transferred from the older people to the younger generation now. Now, as I speak with you now, if you want to build system, if you want to change how Africa is being going, to hold our leaders accountable and all that, all we need to do first <coughs> is to have an orientation of mentality. I was about 13 years ago, 40, for, let me say 14 years ago, I was in a student leadership. I was the national finance officer of Association of Secretaryship and Management Studies student across Ghana Polytechnics. Then when we were handed over by our predecessors, I saw zero, zero in the account. I saw zero in the account. When we came into force, I was the finance officer. So I was in charge of how money should go and where money should go and all that. There's something that happened. We had nothing in the account when we were handed over. So in the process, we started work. And in the process, the year was already gone. We also needed to hand over. Now, while we were working, my executives will ask me, do we have money in the account? And I will tell them no. They, some of them will ask me. And I loved my president because she was also a woman of integrity. Mm. Now, before we could leave office, by the time we said we, are ha we were handing over to the, to the next persons that were going to take over from us, we handed over to them assets as well as cash at bank. Mm. Now, at the Congress, of the handing over, they saw an account I prepared where it was zero balance and an account we're handing over, which has money inside and assets also left. Mm. So the, the balance sheet was full. So, because I said that if I want to see somebody work or somebody to succeed from me, I have this mindset that the person should not start empty. There should be a foundation of where the person was, was set, was start. So I should leave something behind. Yeah. And this is what we have as a problem of Africa. Yeah. From student leadership. Yeah. To local government. Yeah. Community leadership, local government, national government, federal government. Everybody feels like when there's money in the coffers, they should squander it, finish it up. Even yeah. to today, there are people who feel like federal government allocated a budget of five million for them. And when the year is going to an end and they cannot finish the money, they have to squander it. Yeah. Yeah. The mindset of it, it's 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 a very horrible mindset. What are we living for the next generation? That's what I think of today. Sir, to tell you the truth, by God's grace, by God's grace, the level I've gotten to in life, I am satisfied. Mm. God has blessed me. It's not about cars, houses. It's, not, it's about how have you lived your life? How many people have you impacted? Yeah. That is the blessing I'm talking about. Yeah. Many people see blessing, even if they stole the money mm. and bought a car, they will still go to church and give testimony <laughs> that God has blessed them. Is that a blessing? No. Well, that, that tells me it's a, 
society issue societal issue yeah so we we my vision is not even with people who are 40 years and above now i'm just 38 i'll be 39 very soon mm. few this time by god's grace oh, God. my Congrats. vision is not even the people who are 40 years and above my vision is the younger generation who are between the ages of 15 to down and those who are yet unborn. That is where I'm thinking. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with you. I agree. Because, See, sorry, go on. If we don't transform the mindset of these young people, mm. it will get to a time we might not have a society again. Okay. Okay. And that's what we would destroy the world. Yeah, you can see, see what is happening in other societies. Oh yeah, they oh, are yeah. destroying the world already. Yeah, I have, I have a seven-year-old nephew who I saw was lying down and praying. And do you know what the young man was telling God? God, please give me pen. This young man was praying very hard. God, please give me pen. God, please give me pen. God, please give me pen. Then I stood up. And I said, hey, young man, what prayer are you saying? He said, I'm, I'm asking Jesus to give me pen. Then I said, there are things you disturb God over in terms of prayer. Mm. And there are things you must find solutions to. That is why God created you with brain. So listen to me. Next time, when you need something, you need pen. Things that are physical that you can provide, you can get. Don't go asking God. That is why God gave you father. That's why God gave you uncle. So what does it mean to stand up and say, or what will happen if you stand up and say, uncle, please, my pen has finished. I need a new pen. But rather, he was praying. So I have to teach him the right way. Yeah. Now, there are problems in Africa that we have created ourselves. And we want God to solve for us. Okay. That is the problem of holding our political leaders accountable. We cannot say we, we want Africa to prosper. And yet we go to church and we pray to God to to let our leaders change or to do without we holding them accountable. How many people in organizations give accounts? How many people, how many churches give accounts? How many government parasitas give accounts? Has the, our government come out monthly and give account to the people and say, oh, this month, Nigeria received $5 billion. The $5 billion Two billion dollars went this way. One billion dollars went this way. Um, five hundred million went this way. Two hundred million went this way. And this is how much we have in our account. Have no. they had any no governor like that or no. any president like that? No. And we are keeping quiet because we have already sold our our conscience with five thousand naira. 1,000 naira, 500. The political leader who came to you and you collected money, 500 for him, before you voted for him, you have already sold your integrity and your authority. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So we'll, we'll search. If I gave you 500 for you to vote for me, and I'm in the office and I'm squandering the monies that I just imagine if every voter that wants to vote, is voting based on merit. And we are not voting based on vote buying or what we got from a politician. And we voted right leaders. The people who put them there without we, letting them buy our vote, we can always stand up and ask them questions. Yeah. But here we have collected our share of the corruption. Yeah. So I don't blame the elderly people. 
I blame even the youth today. Mm. Mm. If we can stand up and say no to no and yes to yes, there's no way we cannot develop from there. I, I agree. I agree. Uh, but I, I say this. Uh, I've said this several times to people that people in Africa that are below the age of 40 have not seen, most, most of our countries have not seen the country work. For example, in the 70s, when I was a young child, electricity was constant. Okay. Uh, but from the seventh from the eighties, it is early eighties, we started having constant blackouts. You know. Uh, and so many other things started going wrong. And uh People of the age of 40 and below have never seen Nigeria work. Okay. And as I, I assume the same thing for Ghana and many, many other countries in Africa. So see, we need we need that re reorientation. Okay. But the question is this: who would do that for us? Because, because many people we look up to don't have that integ integrity to pass to pass down. See, that's that's the problem we have. When I look at Africa, Africa has all it takes to be a world power. Yeah. And when we talk of a nation, a nation is made up of communities or yeah. tribes. Tribes are made up of communities. Yeah. Communities are made up of families. Yeah. So the ball, the, the thing that ball, that the solution is not in national orientation or presidency. I agree. The solution starts from the family. Okay. That as I speak with you, if I go home with $5 million or my mother sees me buy a car beyond a particular amount and she knows the kind of job I do and she knows how much I earn, the woman is going to ask questions and say and ask me, where did I get the money from? Yeah. If I'm not able to answer where I got the money from, by all sincerity and by legally, my mother is not going to touch that money. She will not eat from it. And even myself, the question is, will you do things based on the fact that you want to please the society mm. or you want to do things to please yourself. Okay. I was looking at, I was talking to someone and I said, okay, the other day I was training a lot of youth and it was free. And I asked the person to calculate if I'm to charge $60 for the training per the number of students that were trained, how much will be involved? And the person said, you have not close to Three hundred thousand dollars, or hey, three million, three million dollars, based on the people you have trained and yeah. the free trainings you give, you make like three million dollars even out of that. Yeah. Then I told the person, but all this I let it go for free. Yeah. What am I trying to do? It would take one, two, three, four, five, six. Not more than 100 people to transform Africa. Okay. If we all start doing the things we are supposed to do, rightly for our family, our community, our society, 
the transformation will be quick. For instance, if you impact one youth in Africa, automatically you have impacted five people of the family. Yeah. Because the youth will take care of the other five. Mindset change will happen there. Yeah. So all we need as part of our system is to incorporate, even into our education system, the need for patriotism, the need for discipline, the need for accountability, the need for, for transparency, the need for integrity, the need for transparency. Okay. Now, when we imbibe these values and virtues, we will understand what we need to do for our communities. Our, if you want to grow, go global. May, just be, 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 just be a champion locally because going global is one way or the other affecting your community. What have you done for your community? What have you done for your society? That is going global. Okay. Because I, I don't think I can do things for the young people in China, neglecting the young people in Africa. That's true. That's true. Your home first. That's true. So let African youth, let's begin to build. I don't like complaint. If you if you've heard me, I've never even partnered with the government for projects I'm doing. I don't expect money from government because there was a time I wanted to train 500 schools in Nigeria called Project 500 on cyber ethics, looking at the ethical use of the cyber world. And I wrote to the Ministry of Education, and they told me they don't have a budget for it. <laughs> and guess how much was the money? I only asked them for a little support, and they could not respond back to me positively. I was never discouraged. I still went ahead and do the little I'm doing. So one way or the other, from that day, I zeroed my mind on government. Mm. I don't have any business with government. If I earn $5,000, I make sure I put it back into the training programs, carry the team, go to a community train, go to university train for free, and we are doing this. That is the little contribution I can give to Africa. The last time we trained youth from Sierra Leone, um, we have other programs also lined up for Kenya, for South Africa, for Liberia, and all that, the little I could do, I would do for Africa. Uh, and, and it's not even you're about... Doing, you're doing a lot. You're doing a lot. And I'm doing it because um, what I'm looking at, I'm not looking at today. I'm looking at the future. It is better to leave this world with a good name than to leave this world with riches and money stuck in your bank account in Europe, in Swiss accounts, in Switzerland. In, 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 in accounts in America. Just imagine somebody who died years ago before I was born or somebody who became president. And then at the end of the day, every year, there's some money that is coming in his name. It's only one country or it's only in Africa that I've heard that somebody died and every day he sends money to the country. The question is, See, Can brother, <laughs> this 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 topic will continue. Continue. See, we have we have so many so many challenges. Yes, we have so that... many challenges. Uh, <laughs> see, and I'll tell you, uh, people might, might disagree, but uh, that's what uh, I wake up wake up every day. And I'm happy. Why? Because there's work to do. Okay? There is work to do. See, without challenges, Africa will never grow. Okay? So we have work to do.